wealth if you and if you want to if you, there is a difference between the total antibodies and the igm titer then if that difference is sufficient that means the patient is in recovery and now the uh, igg titers are higher taking a quick look at hepatitis e now after we take a look at this then we we'll go to the pathology so taking a quick look at hepatitis c e, it is a calcivirus single stranded again rna virus incubation again can be about 6 weeks to 2 to 6 weeks again same enterically or water borne transmission it is a self limiting disease and is not associated with chronic liver disease however what is important is it has a very high mortality amongst pregnant women so up to 20% mortality in pregnant women and unlike in the remaining populations that is why hepatitis c becomes very important and a matter of concern i'll not go into details of this because this replicates what we have seen in hiv so it is absolutely the same and it will be repeated in your tutorials so now let's look at this this is a 28 year old male with mild nausea ast and alt mildly elevated total ig uh, immunoglobulin anti hav the total anti hav is greater than igm hav what is the diagnosis can anyone tell me tell me can you type it out quickly in the box i'm waiting the total hav is higher than the igm so i can't see any typing so i think i will have to answer your question because of lack of time so this means that the patient has gone into a convalescence because the total levels are higher than the igm yes someone has typed ansh paliwal recovering hepatitis infection correct okay now what is non a non b hepatitis i just told you in the beginning of the lecture quickly type in someone non a non b hepatitis non a non b hepatitis it is a serum hepatitis it is type, type c very good shreya anand this is hepatitis c so hepatitis b virus let's first look at b before we go to non a non b now this is a uh, heparna virus i am not in the presentation mode so let me just do that yeah so this is a non a uh, uh, this is hepatitis b virus which is a dna virus incubation period is longer than you see in the a and e so it is 4 to 26 weeks now here again i have limited and it is self limiting i'll just tell you about that and can progress to chronic disease this is the structure but i'm not going to go into details of this as this will be covered in microbiology the importance of the structure is the different parts of the a uh, structure of the virus gave rise to different antigens and a lot of these have a different role whether it is in replication whether it can be seen in the pathology for example hepatitis b surface antigen can be identified in pathology and whether it has a role in replication or in carcinogenesis and therefore these are the importance of the various parts of antigen that that will be covered in microbiology now the transmission as i said is horizontal it can be parenteral by blood and blood products iv drug abuse acupuncture needles sexual transmission and vertical transmission through the neonate from the hbsg positive mother now this is very important people give it very little importance as compared to hiv but however the transmission of hepatitis b and c is similar to hiv and has similar uh, consequences in the sense that the long term prognosis may not be good unless it is treated therefore the same sort of precautions are required for hiv hpv hcv the concentration in various body fluids now what you will see over here is not much in urine feces sweat tears or breast milk but it is very high in blood serum and wound exudates which is why this sort of transmission can occur it is not found in stool so it will not be detectable by stool samples and there is no fecal oral transmission it can have an acute hepatitis these are the various clinical outcomes okay so it b unlike c can have a phase of acute hepatitis with recovery and clearance of virus which is why self limiting in some cases it is non progressive chronic hepatitis in such cases but 
in uh, some percentage of cases, which is, I'll just show you, uh, progressive chronic disease can occur. And what is the consequence of that? Cirrhosis or even hepatocellular carcinoma. In a very small percentage of those that got acute hepatitis, fulminant hepatitis with massive hepatic necrosis can occur and it can go into liver failure as we discussed in the previous lecture. And they can be an asymptomatic kidney stage. So the patient was asymptomatic to begin with. He had a self-limiting disease, so he recovered. But he has not fully cleared the virus and therefore can still be at the stage when he can transmit the infection. Or he may have cleared the virus or he may transmit the infection. So that is an important thing to remember in hepatitis B. Now, I think this is all given in your textbook, but this is important. So they can get an acute infection. And of this acute infection, a large percentage is a very subclinical disease, so mild prodrome sort of symptoms. And those with subclinical disease will recover and probably clear the virus or they may not even have much prodrome, but a small percentage will remain carriers. That is, they do not clear the virus, so they can transmit the infection. Then after the acute in infection, 20 to 25% will develop acute hepatitis. Of those also, 99% recover. Only and 1% will get permanent hepatitis and could die. And about 4% will have chronic hepatitis. So chronic hepatitis develops in a small percentage of those that get hepatitis B virus infection, okay? Unlike hepatitis C. So there, there is a difference. And some percentage will remain carriers and they can transmit infection. And sometimes over the years, they may get a, a, a exacerbation and a, a, you know either a reinfection or superimposed infection. But 4% will remain chronic hepatitis of these 20 to 30% will go into cirrhosis. Now that is within a certain time span. Actually speaking, most of these will develop chronic liver disease with fibrosis and over a period of time, depending on what is the time that they got the infection, they will gradually progress to cirrhosis. Those that go to cirrhosis can develop hepatocellular carcinoma or die due to complications of cirrhosis, which we discussed in the last lecture. Some can develop hepatocellular carcinoma, even though they do not yet have cirrhosis. They have the chronic hepatitis features and they develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, this is the serology. Again, I won't go into details except to tell you a few important points that when the symptoms appear, that is the time when hepatitis B antigen, S antigen, and HPV DNA, if you are testing for that, will be positive at the time that the symptoms appear. However, there are, of course, some people that have a subclinical infection and remain asymptomatic. And when the anti-HBS titers develop, that is when the recovery has occurred or they have cleared the infection and they are now immune to it. So this is the basis of vaccination to develop the anti-HBS titers. And at the time that the symptoms occur, the symptoms are due to the presence of virus specific T cells. These are CD4 and CD positive T cells, which give rise to interferon gamma. And these give rise to the various um, symptoms that you see in the acute phase. In the chronic phase, the HBS AG will persist. It will not fall as it did in the acute phase. And therefore, anti-HBS titers are lowered and are not significant. And uh, anti-hepatitis B core titers are increasing instead. And the symptoms may, in fact, go down. So the mm -hmm. symptoms may recover, but the chronicity is determined by the fact that these antigens and the HPV DNA titers remain significantly high. So even if the symptoms go down, but HPS, AG, E antigen, and the HPV DNA titers remain significantly high. So the interpretation of the serological markers, anti-HPS, AG appears before onset of disease, peaks during a world disease, and declines in three to six months. So if it does not, then that means that the chronic hepatitis has developed. 
and in fact the definition of chronic hepatitis thereby is persistence of this uh, hepatitis B surface antigen in hepatitis B for more than six months. Hepatitis E antigen, HPV DNA and DNA polymerase, they all appear soon after the HBS antigen and therefore they signify active viral disease because S can appear even before the symptoms. The antibodies, hepatitis, uh, the antibody against hepatitis B core. Now this appears also just before the symptoms and corroborates with increased transaminases. This is replaced, IgM is replaced by IgG. So this is replaced by IgG within months, but if it is present, then it indicates persistent infection. Anti-hepatitis B E antigen, this disappears and after it disappears, it indicates that the disease is on the way. So the disease is now in the recovery phase. And IgG, the anti-HBS, this occurs weeks after HBS antigen disappears. So HBS antigen is what was used to detect it in the serum. And anti-HBS, uh, anti-HBS is what is used to detect it in the serum, right? So therefore, there could be a window period when hepatitis B surface antigen has disappeared and anti-HBS has not yet appeared. And it is in that window period where you are neither detecting surface antigen nor the antibody that it appears that the patient does not have hepatitis B. However, the patient does have hepatitis B if you have tried to test only during this window period. And earlier, therefore, when blood banks were doing only this sort of testing, the, uh, cases would get missed. And therefore, now this sort of testing alone is discouraged in blood banks and you have to do nucleic acid DNA testing to be able to be sure that there is no hepatitis B infection before transfusing the blood. So now let's look at the... Um, so this, I think I have uh, discussed most of it and will be discussed again in the tutorial. So let us uh, move forward. So uh, before we move to hepatitis C, a quick look at what we talk, everyone's talking about these days, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Now this, as we know, mainly affects the lungs. However, it can affect the liver's, liver directly also. And we see occasional cases of liver biopsy of patients of SARS-CoV-2. It can affect the liver directly or the effect on the liver could be a consequence of the hepatic hypoxia and venous congestion or the drugs that are given to combat SARS-CoV-2 infection. And sometimes this can lead to liver failure and it can also lead to viral shedding in the GI tract and therefore fecal presence of uh, COVID-19 uh, and, and, uh, uh, virus has been detected in the fecal matter. So this is something that one has to remember. Now going on to hepatitis C, which was earlier called the non a non b virus. This is again a single standard RNA virus of the flaviviridae group, which has an incubation period of two to six weeks. It does not usually cause an acute infection. If it does, it's usually mild and undetected. But it commonly causes persistent infection and chronic hepatitis. This is the thing that is unlike hepatitis B virus. It is an unstable virus with multiple genotypes and various quasi species also. So it is the because of the presence of these genotypes and quasi species that it is very difficult to develop a, a, a vaccine against hepatitis C virus. So therefore, though we have a vaccine against hepatitis B virus, there is yet no vaccine against hepatitis C virus. And a lot of research keeps going on, but a good vaccine has not yet been developed. These, this is the structure. Again, I'm not going to go into details as it will be covered later. However, the importance of the structure is in trying to develop a vaccine against this virus. Now, why is the vaccine not there? Because of the variability in the virus, various genotypes and quasi species are there. And therefore, and these variable regions of the envelope protein, which do not allow a vaccine to get developed for this. 
risk factors again are the same as the IV drug abuse, surgery, navy stick injury, healthcare workers. Um, mode of transmission is the same as HPV. Vertical transmission is a little less. And then there are some people that are not are with any of these risk factors, have had no uh, history of any, um, you know, uh, there's no vertical transmission, sexual transmission is unlikely, but still they have HCV and one cannot know why, uh, what, what was the risk factor in such a person. So whether even something as small as a, you know, uh, earlobe piercing or a pedicure or a tattoo from unsterile instruments can cause it is uh, some of the theories that have been proposed. Now, let's look at this similar to hepatitis B. Now, unlike hepatitis B, acute infection does not occur very commonly. If it occurs, it's mild and it just gives rise to resolution. And it is a subclinical phase which goes in 85% of the cases into a chronic infection. Very rarely is there a fulminant or a clinically uh, significant acute infection. So most will go into chronic hepatitis phase. Now, observe over here that only 15% resolve, whereas 85% will go into chronic hepatitis. So unlike Hep B, where there is a large percentage which does resolve, in C, that does not occur. And those that go into hepatitis C, 80% will have stable disease and 20% will go on to cirrhosis. This stable disease, some people propose that these are slow fibrosis. So although they are stable, over the years, they may still develop cirrhosis. But uh, in general, 20% definitely go into cirrhosis. Of course, 50% stable, that means compensated cirrhosis. And the remaining 50% will have decompensated cirrhosis, go into liver failure and death. And a lot of those that get cirrhosis will also have developed hepatocellular carcinoma, some of those. And in fact, unfortunately, there are patients of both hepatitis B and C wherein the first time they present, they already have cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. And that is an unfortunate thing, of course, but uh, that is a very small percentage. So this is the serology of hepatitis C. Again, over here, the HCV RNA is detected. It's, uh, serum transaminases are uh, raised. At that time, HCV RNA is usually detectable. And anti-HCV uh, positivity comes out a little later, in fact. So initially, if it is negative, one should repeat the test after some time as it may be positive or go in for an HCV RNA. This is during the acute phase. In the chronic phase, HCV RNA persistently remains positive, even though the transaminases may decline. Therefore, Normal transaminases does not indicate it is not HCV. If there is any clinical reason to suspect, then HCV RNA should be uh, 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 tested for. And struffs and peaks of the serum transaminases may occur as the disease gradually progresses. Hepatitis D is a defective RNA virus, which is why it cannot cause infection on its own, because it cannot replicate on its own. And as it cannot replicate on its own, it is dependent on hepatitis B virus. You never see only B. And this then develops as two forms, either as a co-infection, that is when the person, since this is also transmitted similarly through blood-borne infection, so the person gets B and B together. Or as a super-infection, that when the person already has an underlying HPV infection, later a HPV infection develops. And sometimes these infections can be more severe than HPV alone. So the outcome, again, in a person with HPV and HPV, if it is a co-infection, then chronic hepatitis can occur, fulminant hepatitis can occur, but luckily large number can recover also. If it is a super-infection, then usually they, since it is already on an HPV infected patient, then a larger percentage goes into chronic hepatitis phase and only a small percentage will recover. Now, 
as you can see in the percentages here, if there is an HTV plus HPV infection, whether it is co-infection or super infection, a larger percentage goes into pulmonary hepatitis and hepatic failure than HPV infection alone. I'm going to skip this for now and um, come on, on to the pathology. So looking at the pathology, this is the various types of um, formats that one can see. The patient can have a carrier state without disease. The patient can be asymptomatic, but on serology you are detected. So he has the infection, but is asymptomatic. Then the patient can have an acute phase, which we discussed, the acute icteric. So like acute hepatitis, the person will present or with chronic hepatitis, which will progress to cirrhosis and NCC or it will not progress or the patient may just have a mild acute infection and be in convalescence. So this is as discussed. And um, so when the recovery occurs, either recovery will occur or progression will occur after an acute infection. If recovery occurs, very good. If progression occurs, it can be from an acute, it can be fulminant hepatitis or it can be chronic hepatitis or it can be a carrier state. So they don't really have much of symptoms. Transaminases are also not very much deranged, but they can spread the infection. This is a case of acute hepatitis, wherein you can see that the liver has shrunken and developed all these sort of, uh, if you sort of a straight border over here. And this I showed you last time also, the patterns of in injury in acute hepatitis. So a lot of lobular inflammation can occur, that's inflammatory cells in the lobular parenchyma. And then as you see these sinusoids over here, all these sinusoids, okay? These are the sinusoids in between. The sinusoids also look very active, why? Because they have both inflammatory cells and the Kupfer cells are also now active, trying to eat up these inflammatory cells and they become activated because of the presence of the uh, virus. And they are trying to get the T cells to control the viral infection. So we have lymphocytes, often T cells. We have macrophages in the sinusoids and we have the uh, inflammatory cells and the hepatocytes themselves also some may show apoptosis, as we are seeing over here, with the darkly eosinophilic um, cytoplasm and a pycnotic nucleus, or some may show ballooning. So here we can see an apoptotic cell, and some of these hepatocytes that have become larger, pale, rounded, this is ballooning injury. So both hepatocytic as well as ballooning injury, uh, apoptotic or ballooning injury can occur. And if the injury is extensive, so it is here, you can see the central vein and viral hepatocytes around it. Whereas here now, this area at the right of the liver biopsy, no viral hepatocytes are present. So acute hepatitis B virus infection can cause collapse or bridging necrosis. If it occurs, bridging necrosis occurs, it is likely that it may go into a chronic hepatitis phase. So this I had shown you last time are the features of acute hepatitis. But here now we're going to see what is there that is an acute versus chronic hepatitis. So in acute hepatitis, you'll see all these except for the last two. These I've described to you, lobular disarray, collapse, ballooning of hepatocytes, apoptosis, polystasis, lymphocytic inflammation, Kupfer cells with steroid macrophages, all of these can be seen in chronic except for collapse and cholestasis, which are not seen unless there is an acute on chronic infection or it is an end stage liver. Otherwise, you will not see collapse and cholestasis, but you'll see these remaining. In addition, what you see is interface hepatitis and absence of fibrosis. Interface hepatitis can be seen sometimes very inquisitive and focal in hepatitis A, but usually it is a hallmark of chronic hepatitis. Similarly, fibrosis. Since there's no chronic phase, you will not see fibrosis in any acute hepatitis. So in A and E, you will not see it. But in B, C and D, you can see the presence of fibrosis. So chronic hepatitis definition is a continuing inflammation of the liver without improvement for at least six months, especially when we're talking about viral hepatitis B. 
the histological features are these four features form the histological hallmarks of chronic hepatitis one is interface hepatitis two lobular inflammation three portal inflammation for fibrosis lobular inflammation as the name suggests is inflammation in the lobular parenchyma destroying some of the hepatocytes it can also occur in the form of tuberculosis and ballooning injury portal inflammation as it indicates is inflammation of the portal tract interface hepatitis is when the inflammation spills from the portal tract into the lobular parenchyma and fibrosis so now i will show you the rest again it is just other pictures to show you the same this is lobular inflammation portal inflammation and here this is a portal tract and this dot dashed line shows its interface and when these inflammatory cells are spilling out into the lobular parenchyma and destroying the hepatocytes there that is interface hepatitis and of course fibrosis can occur and especially once bridging fibrosis occurs it is definitely a hallmark of chronic hepatitis but even lesser amount of fibrosis is a feature of chronic hepatitis now this is a normal portal tract just to show you the interface this is the hepatic bile duct hepatic artery again a ductular profile this is the vein a portal vein and so all this little bit of parent uh, connective tissue which is holding these three structures with a few sprinkling of few inflammatory cells up to 2 to 5 can be normal this is the interface now when the inflammatory cells in these and are crossing this interface and destroying some of these hepatocytes at the interface that is when it is called interface hepatitis now are there any features that are specific to hepatitis b and c yes so features specific to hepatitis b are these ground glass hepatocytes so these are the normal hepatocytes in the lower left area that you can see with a slightly uh you know granular um, eosinophilic cytoplasm which has um, you know uh, empty areas also within it where is in ground glass it is like a frosted glass right so in ground glass appearance there is no uh, it is opaque it is uh, opaque and granular eosinophilic but opaque unlike here here where the normal hepatocytes where it is not completely filled with this and it is not opaque and then if we do immunohistochemistry we can stain this with antibodies to hepatitis b surface antigen and similarly if this sort of a picture if it is seen in the nuclei these are called sanded nuclei due to excess of hepatitis core antigen and this can also be stained with an antibody against the core antigen so ground glass hepatocytes due to hepatitis b surface antigen sanded nuclei due to hepatitis b core in hepatitis c what are the specific features the presence of steatosis of fatty change in the liver usually it's not so severe but about 20 to 50% of the liver parenchyma having steatosis the presence of lymphoid aggregates in the portal tract and injury to the bile duct so this is a bile duct here which is injured this is a lymphoid aggregate this is a higher power on the right side and this is steatosis these three features are supposed to be more common in hepatitis c viral infection as opposed to hepatitis b now let's look at this uh, so please get ready to type something in the chat box and um, so this is um, bilirubin very mildly deranged alt ast are raised aline phosphatase is normal albumin is low and pt inr is raised so what is the type of liver injury can anyone answer that what is the type of liver injury that we are dealing with here is it acute or chronic this is in a 40 year old male with weakness anorexia and abdominal swelling ast alt are mildly deranged Alkaline phosphatase is normal and albumin is low, 2.8. PT and INR is raised, 1.4. So I don't know if anybody is answering or not. So in case you are uh, now, let me give you some more information. 
total anti hav is raised hb sag is positive hb e antigen is positive anti hcv is negative so yes abhinav has said that this is chronic yes that is chronic hepatitis and in this case when we saw the serology total anti hcv means he is 40 years old maybe in his childhood he developed hcv infection or got the vaccination so total anti hcv is high which has no meaning for the current infection but as hepatitis b surface and e antigen is raised that means he has a chronic hepatitis b uh, viral infection yes i'm sure thank you so chronic hepatitis now this is a case of uh, I'm sure i should be sure yeah okay bilirubin is raised 3.2 alt is very high ast is also markedly deranged these are more than 10 times normal alkaline phosphatase is mildly deranged albumin is even lower two and ptinr markedly deranged 2.4 so what do you think this mm. is type of liver injury is anybody wants to answer this this type of liver injury bilirubin is high ast alt markedly raised alkaline phosphatase mildly raised i'm not giving the serology here just this albumin is two PTINR is 2.5. Anybody wants to try and answer what this is? Acute or chronic or chronic fulminant or liver failure, what would you like to choose? So this is uh, converted into multiple choice. Yes, this could be acute. And because of the presence of albumin 2 and PTINR 2, do you think this is uh, a mild acute or acute fulminant or could it be going into liver failure? So this is uh, something that is more likely, it is a severe infection. If the PTINR is so deranged and albumin is high, it is severe infection. Yes, Ansh, that's right. This is acute fulminant hepatitis. Now, what is the importance of 28th July? I'm just bringing this up before I go on to the next two minutes of the lecture, last two minutes. This is World Hepatitis Day. In Delhi, we celebrate a hepatitis day on December 4th. That is the hepatitis day that was actually started by Dr. Sareen and uh, luckily I was a part of that, that we did the hepatitis day in Delhi in order to increase awareness. The World Hepatitis Day is on July 28th. And usually our lectures are always in July, incidentally. So July 28th is the World Hepatitis Day where information about hepatitis is spread and about getting vaccinations and about, uh, you know, um, uh, not uh, using uh, used needles and uh, importance in taking care of, for the blood banks and blood transfusion. So this sort of messages are spread and it's very important to spread it even at a school level. These messages are then spread. Now we come to the last few slides. Drug or toxin-induced liver injury was also a part of what I uh, the lecture today. So although we have spent a large num amount of time talking about viral hepatitis, because drug or toxin-induced injury can have any morphology, but why is it important to talk about it at all? Because at the time that you are taking a history from a patient, you must, must, and must take a history of whether he is taking any drugs. Now, remember these, I'm not talking about the drugs of abuse. I'm talking about medicinal drugs, okay? So any medicinal drug that the person is taking or anything that could be a toxin, like any Ayurvedic medicine, any uh, a herbal concoction that the person is taking. So uh, he thinks I'm just having some uh, herbal jelly booty, this, that, the other. No, that could cause serious liver injury. Now, coming back to medicinal drugs. So drug-induced liver injury, there are a few important things to remember in this. One, it could be predicted in certain drugs. Like you know that certain drugs, INH, rifampicin, they can cause liver injury. Methotrexate, it can cause liver injury. It may not. So the patient is followed up every week or two weeks. The LFTs are done and you follow up the patient and you see and usually if they do not rise 
they may rise a little bit, but if it is not more than, say, two times normal, it is okay. The drug is meta being metabolized in the liver, so a little bit of increase occurs, but then it settles down and there is no drug induced liver injury, but it can cause it. So one has to be aware. Similarly, with methotrexate, it can cause it in the chronic long run. So the patient has to be followed up for liver injury, and one, the clinician then knows what is the time at which that drug has to be withdrawn. And then there are idiosyncratic reactions. For example, even drugs that are very commonly used. 99.9% .9 patients know nothing happens, such as acetaminophen. But in an occasional person, an idiosyncratic reaction can occur and it can cause acute liver injury. Okay, Abhinav has asked a question, which I will just answer at the end of the lecture. So just give me a few minutes, Abhinav. Let's just finish with uh, drug-induced liver injury. So, and what is the second thing that to remember about drug-induced liver injury? It can have any pathological pattern. So, it can show steatosis, it can show cholestasis, it can show eosinophils as part of the inflammatory infiltrate, it can show granulomas, it can show a zonal necrosis as in acetaminophen. So, large areas of the liver get necrotic and it causes a fulminant liver failure. It can show viral hepatitis like, as in INH, that is the drug that we use in ATT. It can show, as I said before, cholestatic. It can show a mixed pattern. So both a hepatitic and cholestatic pattern of injury. Or it can show a vascular injury. So these are various types of liver injury that we see on pathology. We have shown you acute and chronic so far. So there are various morphological types of injury like cholestatic, vascular, etc. that are seen. And if there is no other known cause for that injury, drug-induced liver injury must be excluded. Or if you're seeing a mixed pattern of injury or too many eosinophils, definitely rule out a drug-induced liver injury. How do you say that it is a drug-induced liver, uh, liver injury or DD as it's known in the liver circles? There has to be a temporal relationship. That means the drug has to have been started sometime prior to the liver injury occurring and not the other way around. That the liver symptoms are there earlier, now he's taking some medicine. No. You have to exclude competing causes, such as if it's a hepatitic pattern of injury, there, is there any viral hepatitis, right? Is the patient obese if there is a steatohepatitic pattern of injury? Does the patient take alcohol? Okay. So these sort of things have to be excluded. Then there should be a known potential of injury of that drug. Of course, if it is unknown also, you can keep it in the uh, differential diagnosis. But if there is a known potential of injury of that drug, and especially if it shows the same pathological pattern in the past, for example, INH showing a viral hepatitis-like pattern. I have a patient who's taking INH. I get a liver biopsy. He has a viral hepatitis-like pattern. So it could be due to INH because it's showing the same pattern that it has a known potential for. And the final, of course, is de-challenge, de-challenge, which of course is something that has to be done with great care, if at all required. So that may or may not be done. And recently, in fact, there was an article in the paper just a few days ago this last week that's, uh, like I told you, Ayurvedic medicine. So Giloy said medication caused liver damage in patients with, um, these are the patients who were taking this Ayurvedic uh, medicine for immunity, increasing their immunity against COVID-19. But that instead caused a severe liver infection. So therefore that has to be taken care of. There are some Ayurvedic medicines that are given that do not cause, but uh, one has to know what medicine one is taking and whether or not it has a potential for causing any liver injury. So, Finally, to end this lecture, and then I'll take up Abhinav's question. What is the recipe for an optimal diagnosis? One, an understanding clinician. That is, he must understand and take all the relevant history. This is not really related to the lecture I've taken, but this is something that every, all of you must know because half of you are going to become clinicians, more than half, let's say 95%, and 5% are going to become pathologists. Therefore, all of you need to know this. To you, they, you have to have an understanding clinician that understands the disease and when to do a biopsy and what all information must be given to the pathologist. An adequate biopsy must be taken. It has to be fixed in formalin. 
and then send to the pathologist. As far as the pathologist is concerned, he must be interested, he or she, and um, the pathology slide by our technicians must be prepared by in, and in an impeccable manner. So the slide that we see must be a well cut and well stained slide, then looked at in the microscope by an interested pathologist, and then ultimately intelligent clinical pathological cooperation. So these are just a few pearls of wisdom to end the lecture, but now to take Abhinav's um, question, how to differentiate between fulminant and liver failure? Uh, there is no differentiation between fulminant and liver failure. Liver failure is a clinical term and fulminant hepatitis is a pathological term. And in fact, those patients that present with acute severe hepatitis or liver failure, two terms are used, submassive hepatic necrosis and massive hepatic necrosis or fulminant and subfulminant uh, liver failure. And in fact, once a, a renowned liver uh, hepatologist said, uh, when asked that is it fulminant liver failure or is it submassive hepatic liver failure, so the uh, clinician just said that, you know, I reserve the term fulminant for patients whom I do not think will recover and the rest I call submassive. So that's just in slightly uh, you know, lighter way in, in a way. But fulminant hepatic failure is what we call when we see large areas of necrosis in the liver biopsy. We call it fulminant or massive or submassive hepatic necrosis. That is fulminant. Liver failure, in a way, is a more clinical term that you reserve for certain. Uh, clinical and biochemical parameters that indicate liver failure, which is what I told you in the beginning, acute hepatic failure. Within a certain period of time, the ASTLT is very high, the PTI INR has to be more than 1.5, there is no underlying liver disease, then it's acute hepatic failure. So that is when you call it hepatic failure clinically. And fulminant can be a clinical pathological term. So that's all. If there are any other questions, of course, I'm happy to answer. And then we may.
Thank <laughs> you. 